Well, here we are again a week and a half, two weeks later. And uh, hello, hello. And, and that we, w one thing about the Supreme Court, and we certainly will, I think you can agree with me, there are, they don't have to be consistent. I mean, they, uh, it, it depends on the times. It certainly depends on the individuals on the court and depends on the, uh, you know, the temper of public opinion as well. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is I'd like to, I'd like to talk about the court and from, from the period right after the Civil War. So let's give it a date. Let's give it 1875. And, 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 let, and, and to bring it up to the, to the, to the outbreak of, of World, War, World War II. And so that'll give us a chance to talk about the court and Roosevelt and the New Deal. And also in that last quarter of the 19th century to talk about the Industrial Revolution and, and how the courts dealt with protecting capital and commerce and from, from unnecessary federal regulation. I mean, state regulation, they could deal with that. You know, but an expanding power of the federal government was something to be guarded against. So these are some broad themes you know, that I'd like to take a look at this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, maybe a question, an observation, or, or, or some, some unfinished business. I always like to use that phrase. And whenever I put a syllabus together, I always use that phrase, unfinished business. And that gives me license to go anywhere, you know, <laughs> with, with unfinished business. So, OK, let, let's, let's, let's take a look at let, Let's begin. Let's begin with the 14th Amendment. There are three Civil War amendments, Amendment 13, 14, and 15. And, and what the 14th Amendment did is that it, it posited, it maintained that the states also you know, must respect the Bill of Rights. In other words, that if you read the 14th, well, let's, let's take a look at it. It's pretty, it's pretty it's, it's explicit. The 14th Amendment in 1868. The 14th Amendment is the most cited amendment in, 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 in history since, the, since 1868. I mean, everything falls under the rubric of, of this phrase, the 14th Amendment. Let me see if I can find it here. Here it is. I'm just going to read the operative part. Here we go. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges of or, and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. No state, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. When the first 10 amendments, actually the first eight, when the Bill of Rights was passed, in 1790, 1791, it was designed to, to limit the powers of the federal government. In 1868, with the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment was written to, one, protect black Americans, and also to ensure that the Bill of Rights be honored by the states. You see, when the Constitution was written, and uh, maybe you've got a thought on this, I don't know. When the Constitution was written, the states were concerned about an overly powerful federal government. So it wasn't, they didn't fear the states. They feared an intrusive, power, powerful federal government. So the, the federal government may not abridge life, liberty, no, I'm sorry, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so forth. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the 14th Amendment said the states also must honor the protections you know, written up that are la labeled designed in the first 10 amendments. Now, this will not happen when it comes to black Americans. Black Americans are cut loose you know, at, the end of the, at the end of the Civil War. What the Supreme Court will rule here is that the, 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 how they will interpret this 14th Amendment at this time is that it involved any state procedures that denied anyone life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It was not designed to inhibit the behavior of citizens. You know, that it was the states, you know, could not deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. An individual 
owning an amusement park or a, or a railroad line or, or whatever, you know, could deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And they meant, and of course, it was black Americans, you know, who were subject to that lack of due process. That due process was, again, the states could not do it. An individual could say, you may not play golf at this golf course or ride in this coach or take this steamship. And, and, and that's how the courts looked at it. And, and let me tell you, that is still a battle that people are working on today, that there is, a, there is a case coming before the Supreme Court this term, or maybe in the spring, I'm not sure. And I have to go back and check the details. And it's this, that the fellow who makes cakes, all right, uh, party cakes and so forth, that I will not, I, I will not take the order of this gay couple because it, I do not want to do it. I disapprove of gay marriage. Now, that's coming before the court again. So we're going to see how the court deals with a, a due process question here and whether that kind of discrimination based on my per personal preference, I choose not to do business with a gay couple and make their wedding cake. So we'll see how the court deals with that. Stay tuned. I mean, that is very much what we're talking about. You had a thought? Oh, I was just wondering why the states couldn't enforce not only a business, but individuals. They weren't required to. They were not required to by law. And again, it's hard for us to recapture, you know, the animosity directed toward black Americans, both, you know, in, in the North and in the South. You know, and I, it's not as if, you know, we're, I'm not trying to whitewash any of this, that the federal government simply did not enforce, and the states did not enforce either. It was, you're, you're, you're very much on your own. This is when the Klan was riding. I mean, this is, these are the night riders. Uh, these are where, even though with the 15th Amendment, you might, try to, you might try to sign up to vote, be careful. Be careful, because one might get a visit from the night riders that don't think you're voting a town meeting tonight. I mean, just don't show up. You know, you know, beaten, you know, beaten, lynched, your, uh, you know, your, you know, where you live, your cabin, you know, burned to the ground. You better, better keep your head down. And speaking to that politically in 1895, again, right in the center of this, will be Booker T. Washington. And I know you remember that name, Booker T. Washington. And his, and he was one of the first intellectual leaders of black America after the Civil War. And Booker T. Washington wrote, a paperback, a, a primer for proper behavior in the, you know, in, in a Jim Crow Reconstruction South, and it was called Up From Slavery. You may have read it in school. It's, I think it's still in print. And, and, and what Booker T. Washington advised is that vocational education, you know, show your worth by vocational education, you know, that you can contribute, and do not demand you know, voting and housing and so forth yet. That will come. That social progress will come when you show that your, your economic benefits to the nation. And in a, in a famous speech, it's called the Atlanta Compromise, I'm doing this deliberately, that Booker T. Washington said that we can be as separate as the fingers on a, on a hand and yet bring that hand together to hold a tool. Uh, to, 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 to wheel a wheelbarrow, to swing an ax. In other, words, in other words, vocational education. We can be as separate as this, and yet we can come together to build the transcontinental railroads, maybe, or the Brooklyn Bridge, or to do, or to do vocational work, farm work. And, and, and Washington, who came from slavery, uh, he remembered the day of Jubilee that he had been a youngster, four or five, six years of age, on a plantation in Georgia. So he was there, he remembered it, as best one can recall, a memory at the age of five or six. And you're dealing with a Jim Crow, violent America. And the federal government, and certainly the state governments, you know, are looking the other way. There was something called the Mississippi Plan. I mean, it wasn't a plan, but it was, it was the way that race relations were, were dealt with in the South, in Mississippi. And it simply was violence, terror, death, lynching, beating, hanging, and burning. That way you keep people in their place. Washington, this is the reality on the ground. As separate as the fingers on a hand, 
and yet we can work together. And he was responding to the reality on the ground and the 14th Amendment, you know, being interpreted by, by these courts in this period as, as inhibiting the behavior of the state, you know, but not so much in terms of, of an individual saying you may not play golf here or, 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 or use this amusement park. You know, there was a case in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. And in Plessy versus Ferguson, you know, the courts ruled. Now, there was one dissent, but the dissent does not matter in this case. You know, it's what the courts decided for the next 50 years. In Plessy versus Ferguson, that separate but equal was constitutional. And just because we have segregated schooling, you know, by law, you know, de, you know, de facto, that it's not unconstitutional. Separate but equal is unconstitutional. The problem, it's not the problem, the irony or, or the, the transgression was, it was certainly separate, wasn't it? But it hardly was equal when you, when you measure, when you quantify, for example, salaries for teachers, the educational level, the quality of the textbooks, the quality of the buildings and so forth. And that law stood. And, and Plessy, and, and, what, and what Plessy, Plessy appealed on the fact, you know, that he wanted to be able to ride in a, in, in, in a train, you know, that was not white only and colored only. I want to be able to use the card that says white only. And he set that up. He passed. Are you familiar with the term pass? You know, that you passed is white. And everybody knew he wasn't. But he sat on that, on that railway car, railroad car, white only, and he got, he got grabbed on it. And he wanted to be and finally made its way to the court. Separate but equal is unconstitutional, uh, is constitutional. And that holds for the next 50 years until Brown versus the Board of Education. Now, the other thing working here, you know, with the other, the other point of view working here with, that was a, in, in conflict with, with, with Booker T. Washington in Massachusetts, it is W.E.B. Du Bois. And, and, and his book, the Souls, of, the Souls of Black Folk, in which he talked about, you know, separate but equal, and these, these race differences are in complete violation of amendments, you know, 13, 14, and 15. And what we need to do is we need to be aggressive. We need to be proactive. And by proactive, he meant, one, forming the, N, the uh, N, what is it, the NAACP, you know, as an organization to combat this. And the interesting thing is, when the NAACP was formed, they had to go to Canada to get hotel rooms. Uh, they, these guys wanted to meet in upstate New York, and in upstate New York, uh, you can't get a room in this hotel. So they had to go across the border to Canada and to meet and form this national organization, you know, the NAACP. Dubois also completely rejected vocational education. It's too slow. It's too accommodating. It's too, it's, it's giving in to Jim Crow. What Dubois recommended was to identify the best and the brightest among us. And by that he meant he called them the talented 10th. That's his phrase, the talented 10th. Identify these people and then push them. You know, push them into the professions, push them into the arts. You know, they were the, you know, they're the tip of the, the tip of the arrow. And when they do well and they succeed, others will follow. See, they'll open everything up. Others will follow. And by that he meant into law school, into medical school, you know, into the professions, uh, in, into, into education, into the universities. Others will follow. Dubois, I will be the example. Just as I helped to form the NAACP, that Dubois is the first PhD, you know, graduated from Harvard in economics. We need economic equality. It's, it's about money, economic equality, the distribution of wealth. Uh, we talk about that today, don't we? You know, the growing maldistribution of wealth. And, and how do you resolve that? Or do you resolve it? Or do you allow, the, do you allow social Darwinism to resolve it? You know, the, the best will rise to the top. We talked about that, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So we have the you know, we have the courts not interjecting itself uh, into race relations. Let it work itself out. That's Eisenhower's point of view, too. You know, and that's why he was so upset with Earl Warren. And we talked a little bit about that earlier also. So the courts are, are, 
are inactive, they're not proactive with regard you know, to the 14th Amendment. Uh, they're also very, uh, just so I get this thought out there in my head, they're, they're, all, they're, they're very proactive in making certain you know, that labor unions do not, do not get a foothold, you know, that we need to protect capital, we need to protect corporate America away from the influence, if you will, of, of labor labor organizations. It's, it is a threat to a rugged, social Darwinistic, laissez-faire America. A thought? Well, uh, when you read the 14th, um, I may have not heard you correctly, but you started out, you said, uh, shall deprive life, liberty of a citizen. And then I thought in the second part of that, you said anyone. Let me read it again. Okay. Let me read it again, and because I, I did move through it. The anyone is how immigrants get legal status in the courts. Is that the, is that the chain? Yeah. Immigration was a problem. Not a problem, it was a big issue. Between 18, what, 1890 and 1920, about 500,000 immigrants came into the country. And that was left to the states to deal with that on an individual basis. But let me read, let me read that operative phrase again. The 14th Amendment, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a long amendment, and, and large parts of it are no longer applicable because it deals with particular punishments for um, Confederate states coming back into the Union. I mean, that's, that's all a moot point now. But for you and for me today, let me, let me read the, first, the entire first paragraph. All persons, section one, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. So there is citizenship for black Americans and for American Indians. I mean, and, I mean there's citizenship right there at the federal level and state level. End of that first sentence. Second sentence. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Now that is very open language, isn't it? Yeah. You know, sub subject to deep interpretation, and it's how the courts interpret that. Black Americans, you're a citizen, you can vote, but the, the state may not prohibit access, but an individual may. And that's why I came back to that you know, fellow who makes those wedding cakes. You know, can he choose not to take your business? Can I choose, I don't want to do business with you because you're a homosexual. I don't want to do business with you or your partner because you're getting married and I disapprove of that marriage. The court's gonna take that up. And that's a deep philosophical, intellectual, religious issue, isn't it? And the courts do not like to get tangled up in that. That's so, that's, pardon me? I don't think that's deep and philosophical. I think that's, <coughs> I'm trying to think of a better word than hate. I think it's, it's prejudice. Prejudice. Hateful? Thank you. Prejudice. Prejudice. Yes. All right. Again, that's, 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 that's your opinion. That's opinion. And we're going to see how nine men and women deal with that. Of course, what they might do, and the courts can do this, they can refuse to hear it. They can duck it. You can duck something if you want to duck it. And, 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 and the courts for 50 years had, duck, had ducked Plessy versus Ferguson. Warren said, I'm not going to duck it. I want to take it. One, two. Yeah, I thought I saw it. Yes. Yeah. And what about the Hobby Lobby case, which they did take? Yeah. Yes, right. Isn't there a parallel? In terms of abortion and funding for abortion or funding for, and funding for, well, yeah. A, a, a person's. Uh, private beliefs. Right. Private beliefs Absolutely. I mean, and in each of these cases, you know, it gets ruled differently and looking at different pieces of the law and the way the law is written. I know it's so confusing. As I said five minutes ago, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. <laughs> Do not look for consistency and except in, in, a few, in a few places. For example, I mean, I think at, at some point, and I'll make a prediction here on our watch, it may not be on this court, you know, but I think at some point the, the, I think the death penalty will be, will be dealt with as cruel and unusual. You know, no cruel and unusual punishment shall be inflicted. You know, that's a, an interesting verb. And I think some court at some point 
will simply say that the death penalty is cruel and unusual. Now that may offend people, it certainly may. You know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, but the court, the court is moving in that direction. And it's going to, and that will, I think that will be declared unconstitutional at some point on our watch. I, I saw something, yes. I, I was just going to say that the, there, there's a tension, though, between, uh, you know, what, the, what, the, what you were saying about uh, the rights of the individual, like, uh, I, I don't want to do business with you. Uh -huh. I, I mean, the right of an individual to say, I don't want to do yeah, business with you. On the one hand, and religion on the other. Freedom of religion, and that's in conflict here. You know, I'll tell you, uh, 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 the court dealt with, the court had to deal with, in, the, in this period also, you know, Mormonism. Yeah. You know, in other words, you know, a guy having three or four or five wives. Mm -hmm. and, and is that offensive religiously, socially, politically? The court had to deal with that, and they, uh, they said, let the states deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to deal with that. <laughs> and while personally, Personally, this, the Chief Justice, I think it was full or white, said, I'm opposed to it, but it's a religious practice. Now, the British, if I can take a trip with you here for a minute, in India, a religious group, I think they were called the Thuggies or something, or, or, the, or that the, when one, when, if, if, your, if your husband died and was on a funeral pyre, that the wife had to leap onto that pyre as well. Now, I don't know how tight you are with your spouse, all right? You know, but the, um, and the British stepped in and said, that is socially, yeah, that is socially, politically, and in a humanitarian way, unacceptable. And they tried to put a stop to it, and they did, but you don't know where every funeral pyre is being, is, is being put together and, and lit up. So these sorts of things are tough. And what Congress has done, and they've done it for years, is they pass on the tough ones. And they throw it to the courts, because I want to get reelected. You know, I, we'll, we'll let the courts handle that. You know, they throw it to the courts, and the courts say, well, we don't want to get involved. We're going to let the states handle it, or let a lower court ruling stand. And it's passing that very warm, that hot potato. So we have these civil rights acts you know, passed after the Civil War as being tempered down by the court's interpretation of the language, the first paragraph of the 14th Amendment. Read it. You know, read it tonight. And, and just the words are wonderful. And they're wide open, aren't they? I mean, they are wide open depending on the time, the defendant, and the, the, attitudinal, the attitudinal capabilities of those sitting on the court. Labor organizations also you know, came under the, under, the micro, under the microscope of the courts and the state courts and the federal court. And looking to protect big business, looking to protect capital, the labor organizations, Congress passed a law and, and the courts agreed with how the law was misinterpreted or misused. It was called the Sherman, Sherman Antitrust Act. Sherman Antitrust Act. You know, to break up monopolies, to be able to promote competition, free trade, and so forth. And here's the phrase. The Sherman Antitrust Act, the operating phrase, prevented illegal restraint of trade. That's the word, words, illegal restraint of trade. You know, that, that cor cor corporate America monopoly, that illegal restraint of trade, for example, uh, the oil, the, um, the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company controlled 95 percent of the oil refining in, in the company in, in the country. Eventually, the eventually the courts will break up, you know, the Standard Oil Company, uh, uh, just like they broke up AT and T. But that's later on. All right, that's 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 a little bit later on. Initially, with the Sherman Antitrust Act, an illegal restraint of trade, that. The act was written to break up large monopolies or to promote competition. The way the federal government interpreted and the way the states interpreted that a strike is an illegal restraint of trade. And I'll give you one in particular. A strike 
is an illegal restraint of trade. And early on, as labor began to organize after the Civil War and the, and the rush toward a, the Industrial Revolution, that the word strike was so foreign in, in the American vocabulary that it, was, it had quotation marks around it because it was something they do in Europe. You know, it's not something we do here because it's un-American. You know, it's a social Darwinistic, rugged individual, laissez-faire America. And, and the Horatio Alger book celebrated that, didn't, didn't they? We, we use that term, a Horatio Alger figure, a young lad with, with luck and pluck and hard work and, 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 sh and elbow grease and, 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 and shoulder, to the, shoulder to the wheel, the wheel will move. And, and Horatio Alger was born in Massachusetts. I mean, he, he wrote, I think, somewhere in the West Springfield area. So, so that, uh, that's out there. So when workers organized and, and, and wished to talk about collective bargaining and, 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 not to, and not to change the system necessarily, or to strike it down, but to talk about hours, wages, and working conditions that when, the, when Eugene Debs, when's the last time you heard of Eugene Debs? A, a profile on courage, a hero, a hero to the American labor movement. No one remembers Gene Debs, uh, and, and, I'm, and no one talks about or teaches about Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs, organized was the president of the American Railway Union. And I don't want to get into too many details here. George Pullman, the Pullman Palace car, the, the, the most luxurious way to travel across the country. And the workers, in the, in the, the workers of George Pullman, they struck the Pullman Palace Car Company. And they did that for the simple reason that Pullman, how would you like this for a guarantee? My stockholders, those who, um, those who invest in me, I guarantee them a 12% return every year. Now, wouldn't you like to get 12%? A guarantee. Um, that, that's, that's, that's the minimum right there. Anything above it is fine. You know, but if you believe in me, I believe in you, 12%. So there were, there were panics and busts repeatedly in, in, in the era following the Civil War. The, the economy would expand and contract, expand and contract, boom and bust. And there was a bust, uh, 1893, 1893, 1892. And what Pullman did, see, Pullman cut the wages of his workers so that he could maintain that 12% agreement. Now, he cut the wages of his workers, and they lived in his Pullman town. And the Pullman town is on the National Historic Register outside of Chicago. And he provided you with a place to live. Now, there were restrictions. Uh, no alcohol, for example. He had spies everywhere. And no talk of union and so forth. But from his point of view, I'm, you know, rather than living in, in, in Chicago, you know, full of crime and disease and so forth, you know, that I'm providing you with a, a model town. He saw himself as doing a, a good deed, a mitzvah, a good deed. You work here, I provide you with a job, I provide you with heat and light and gas and water, all of which are above market value because I'm providing it for you and I'm going to deduct the cost from that from your paycheck. Mm -hmm. and, and depending what time period you're talking about, that your paycheck is only good at the company store uh, because I don't want you going into Chicago because it, there's all kinds of trouble in Chicago. But the company store, the prices were high, so Pullman could make a profit. So all of this, you know, living in a Pullman town was living in a, in a Pullman hell. And now he's reduced the wages. And when the workers went to him and asked him, you know, if you reduce the wages, will you reduce the rents and the cost of water, electricity, and gas, and so forth? And he said, no. You know, I still to make, I need to make a profit, and, and stockholders need their 12%. So they struck. And, and, the, and, the, and they struck, and along the railroad lines, because this is the American Railway Union, the guys who changed the cars you know, refused to put a Pullman car on a train, or they would detach it. And you may be saying, well, how can they join an American Railway Union? And here's a, here's a technicality on a technicality. Railroad tracks ran through the Pullman town and into the factory. 
because that's the way you got the, the, the Finnish Pullman Palace car on the track and out to the main line. So the fact that there were tracks running through the Pullman town or beside the Pullman town, you know, into the factory allowed them technically to join the American Railway Union. Debs will agree to the strike. And in order to cripple Pullman, that guys who, who change cars along the line refused to, refused to attach a Pullman Palace car, or, or they would detach it. The government got involved. The federal government got involved. This is a legal restraint of trade. A strike is an illegal restraint of trade because George M. Pullman and his, and his stockholders cannot make a profit. So what, they, so what happens is troops are sent in. I mean, everybody ganged up on labor. You know, the press, the church, public opinion, and the troops went into Chicago. And whenever you put troops in among civilians, particularly striking workers, you're going to have trouble. And there was trouble. I mean, the governor of Illinois you know, contacted President Cleveland and said, I've got things under control. There are a few isolated incidents, but if you send federal troops in here, there's really going to be trouble. And there was, and that's when there was burnings and shootings and so forth, and the entire strike was eventually crushed, a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act not because you have a monopoly on the Pullman Palace Car Company, but because your workers have joined a union and you can't make a buck. And that's not right, because this is a rugged individual, pro-business, government, and court. Pullman had the last word on this one. That when the strike was broken, and it was broken, I mean, there were you know, blacklists and yellow dog contracts. The yellow dog contract simply is you sign an agreement that you will not join a union as a condition of employment. And if you do, if you join a union, you talk union, you distribute union literature, you're gone, automatic, gone, terminated at that point. Pullman, Pullman, if you're late on your rent, I'll give you 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, if you don't make good on your rent, the wagons will come and my goons will unload your furniture, will take the furniture from your home into the wagon and leave it at the you know, where, where the Pullman town ends and Chicago begins. I'm imagine getting evicted that way. And you've got 10 days. Or they leave it right on the sidewalk. But you're out of that place. And, and if you're late with the rent, that's Pullman. That didn't make for good employee relations. So when the strike is over, when the strike is over, and, and, these, and these guys want to get their jobs back, and they're broken, completely broken, he said, you're all done. Well, any one of you who went on strike, you're done. You're being moved out. You will not get your job back here. Those who did not walk out, and there only were a few dozen, I mean, they kept their jobs. And he went into Chicago and hired a whole new labor force. The courts, the government against labor. It is un-American. It's Marxist. It's socialist. That strike led Eugene Debs to join the Socialist Party. And he ran for president five times as a socialist. I mean, the last time, you know, he, he was, I think, almost a million votes, and he was in a federal penitentiary, you know, because of, of, of his support. When Eugene Debs, I, nobody talks about him. One more thing about Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs went to jail during the Wilson administration for refusing to support World War I and urging workers not to report for the draft and, and, not, to, and, and not, to, you know, not, not to enlist. Now, this violated, and Congress passed something called the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, that you cannot say anything, print anything, or meet to talk about uh, not joining up with the war. Debs's position was that this war was being fought on the backs of American labor of European labor and for the benefit of the, of the of captains of industry or the merchants of death as they were described, banking, armaments and so forth. And he urged people not to enlist and he urged people not to, if they were drafted, not to appear. He gets thrown in jail. This is, this, this is the kind of guy Debs is. 
He gets tossed in jail. He gets 10 years. And when the war is over, Warren Harding pardoned him. And, and Warren Harding met with Debs. And he said, Debs is a very congenial guy and the very kind of guy you got to watch out for because he's so congenial and so self-effacing that people will follow him. It's all about the movement. It's not, it's, it's not about me. Here's my point. When he got out of jail, he got his cardboard shoes and he got his, his, his suit, you know, made out of um, what was called just the, the worst it was Negro cloth. Uh, it was called um, shoddy, you know, shoddy, just the poorest quality of cotton. And he got 10 bucks. You know, you, in the old days, you got 10 bucks and you got the handshake from the warden and out you go. He took his 10 bucks and he donated it to the Saquon Vanzetti Relief Fund. Oh. See, Saquon Vanzetti, two workers. The Saquon Vanzetti trial, 1920. Why? Trying to not only organize workers, you know, but also to, to try to build the enrollment in the Socialist Party. And, you know, they, and, and in the, I mean, Saquon Vanzetti were found guilty because they were Italians, right? They were immigrants. They were Italians and they were immigrants and they were anarchists. You know, they were trouble. And they talked about the phrase they used, the immiseration of the, of the working class. Low wages, poor working conditions, and long hours, you know, at 10 cents an hour. So here is Debs. I got 10 bucks. I just did seven years in the federal pen. And I'm giving it to the Sacco Vanzetti Relief Fund. And that's what made him such a hero, you know, to the working, to the working class. For the establishment, he's the enemy. So, so labor is being beaten down here. The black Americans, keep your head down. Keep your head down. Nobody's coming, and no one's picking up the phone when you're dialing 911. You know, you're, you're on your own here. The, let me, let me stop for a minute here. May, anything about labor, capital? At this, at this period of time. You, one did not retire. One simply, when, you, when one could not get out of bed, you simply rolled over and faced the wall and died. Um, you were, I mean, there was nothing, nothing. In 1900, the United States had the, the highest industrial accident rate in the world. And people applauded that. It shows how tough we are. The highest industrial accident rate in the world. And also, the leading economic power by 1900 and the greatest consumer of, or, uh, of raw materials. And that's why Theodore Roosevelt later on will you know, begin work on conservation. The, word, the conservations, that's the word, not environmental issues, conservation. So I, I want to come, I want to move up just a little bit in a moment. Go ahead. Well, the same process was used against all the extractive industry workers, the miners. But the whole West is full of stories of oh, sure. the troops you know, wiping out the towns where these miners lived. Sure. I mean, there were strikes everywhere. And the troops would come in and set up their machine guns, or not machine guns, Gatling guns. But and they he, killed women, children. Oh, absolutely. Women. You know, just fire into the tents. You know, just fire into, into the ten cities. Did I mention the film to you? I'm not quite sure if I did. I, I, I always try to mention it at this point. Are you, did I mention the film to you, Matt One? M-A-T-E-W-A-N? Uh, Matt One. M-A-T-E-W-A-N. It's a film by John Sayles. And we know that John Sayles is a bit of a lefty. And uh, he recently, or, and, and he did the film Amigo. Anybody? The film Amigo. And it deals with the Spanish-American War. And Amigo speaks for itself, doesn't it? You know, and the mayor of the city, and American troops there. And, and he's got people in, the, in, in his town you know, that are supporting the insurrection against the Americans. And the Americans come in, and you know, th they threaten him. You know, and you've you, you got, uh, you, you got traitors in this town. Who are they? I don't know. And they leave. And then the, uh, the, the revolutionaries show up again, you know, and, and they're looking to make trouble for the townspeople because American troops were here. So he's caught between American occupation, sounds like Vietnam, doesn't it? American occupation, or, or Iraq, if Afghanistan, American occupation forces, and, 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 and on the ground, the insurgency. And like in Matmon, the film does not end well. 
Uh, see, he tells a true story. These are true stories. And in Matwan, it's a strike in West Virginia in the coal mines. And if you want to spend the time, it's about a two-hour film. You can probably rent it for two bucks. The only thing is you really need to pay attention to the dialogue. You can't get up and whatever. Uh, it's all the dialogue. And as you listen to the dialogue, the tension between various divisions among the workers. And then they bring in strike breakers. They bring in blacks from Alabama who work the mines. And they don't realize they're being used as strike breakers. And there's tension here. And then immigrants being brought in from Hungary or Czechoslovakia, Bohunks they call them, Bohunks, they're from Czechoslovakia. And, and they're brought in and, they, and they, they all figure, we're being used as strike breakers. And that solidarity begins between, among the black miners, the Czech miners, and the white guys in West Virginia. And it does not end well. It's the law. It's the goon squad. It's, it doesn't end well. It opens beautifully with a young man, a young boy working in the mines at 14. And it ends with that young boy. I'm not, I'm not doing a spoiler here. We see him. It ends with he's got his hard hat on with the light. He's standing in front of the face of coal. And uh, in, between, in between that illuminating opening and that very dark close, you have all the dialogue of, of anti-union, you're socialists, you're un-American, and we will crush you. That film will capture all you know, that we're, we're trying to share this afternoon. Uh, the, so Eugene, Eugene Debs, Eugene Debs becomes a socialist and he gives his money to the Sacco Vanzetti Fund. The New Deal, the New Deal and the way the courts responded to this legislation during the New Deal is very illustrative of the courts looking to t tamp down, tamp down a, an aggressive, intrusive federal government in their view, an aggressive, intrusive, regulatory federal government. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, he's rated, he's ranked among presidential historians, you know, as one of the great presidents, isn't he? You know, it's FDR, it's Lincoln, and Washington. And, and, and depending, on the, depending on the ranking, it's either FDR or Lincoln, Lincoln, FDR. Typically, it's Lincoln, FDR, and Washington. Roosevelt, that the states are broke. You know, we've got an unemployment rate of 25, 30 percent, you know, depending on where you live. Massachusetts, you know, during the worst year of the Depression, 1932, Massachusetts had the lowest unemployment rate in the country. And that was 13 percent. Now, imagine 13 percent unemployment rate today. I mean, the president would already be home in New York, wouldn't he? And Roosevelt's dealing with an unemployment rate of 25 or 30 percent, you know, no matter where you live. And, he's pro and nobody knows much about Franklin Roosevelt, you know, but he isn't Herbert Hoover. You know, and, and Herbert Hoover had been telling Americans simply tighten your belt. There's nothing wrong with the American economy. There's no need for any substantial government intervention and the economy will come roaring back. The people that Hoover helps, and this is so typical of Hoover, Hoover's a self-made millionaire. He's a businessman. And the situation continues to deteriorate in the, last, in the last year of the Hoover presidency, which is 1931 into 1932. Hoover calls in big business. He calls in the big business, the major industries, coal, iron, steel, and so forth, textiles. And he says, look, I've got a deal for you. It's called the, the well, the technical term, uh, the congressional term is called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Here's the deal. That I will give you aid to stabilize your businesses. And you promise me that you will not, that you will, the deal is that you will not lay off anybody else. It's called, the, the, the press picks it up. The New Dealers pick it up and they call it the millionaire dole, the millionaire handout. I will help you stabilize your industry, coal, oil, and steel. And I'll give you money. I'll give you money. But you promise me there'll be no more layoffs so we can stop the hemorrhaging 
you know, among, among the working class. Well, you know what they do with the money. You already know the answer. Uh, they keep it. And they give themselves pay raises, bonuses. They buy out, they, they buy out failing companies. And, and what does not happen, the phrase back then was trickle down. You know, the money, you've, we've, we've heard that phrase recently, haven't we? The money put at the top of the economic pyramid to stabilize big business, you know, will trickle down, you know, into the pockets of the workers. It, it hasn't today, and it did not back in the in 1930. It didn't under Reagan either. So Hoover's gone. I mean, Hoover's gone. When your last name is used not in honor but in dishonor, Hooverville, Hoover Flag, Hoover Soup, in dishonor. And if one were completely broken, down and out on your luck, you walked around with your pants pockets turned inside out. And that meant you were flying a Hoover flag, that you are completely broke. And one of, the, one of the tunes in the jukebox, you know, buddy, can you spare a dime? All right, so that's Roosevelt. We need to put the American people to work. And the government will do this. This was unheard of. This is unheard of. Roosevelt must be a red. It's not the New Deal, it's the Red Deal. That the D stands for delirious, you know, Franklin Delirious Roosevelt. That this is what Stalin is doing. And Roosevelt's a red, he's a communist. He rec as his critics said, that man, that man, that cripple. Roosevelt recognized the USSR in 1933. Of course he would, he's one of them. If you go to the old textbooks, that where Russia, where rather, where the USSR should be, let's say after the Russian Revolution in 1917, there's just a gray area. And because we don't recognize Bolshevism, atheistic communism, Franklin Roosevelt will. And his point is, uh, they're here to stay. Um, they're not going anywhere. We need to deal with these people. I'll tell you some, a mistake that was made politically, and that was in 1949, not accepting Mao. I mean, that changed the whole flow of things. And by, by pretending that Chiang Kai-shek, you know, was the legitimate government in, 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 in Taiwan, I mean, that changed the whole flow of things in the Far East. And we're still dealing with that today, aren't we? We're still dealing with that China problem. Roosevelt, New Deal, jobs. And the court is going to strike at the very heart of the, of the New Deal. They're going to strike at the WPA. They're going to strike at the NRA. Uh, they're going to strike at the. They're going to strike at the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. But but Roosevelt, the states are broke. Only the federal government has the resources and the reach to 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 be able to affect the economy of all the states. States are broke. They cannot make their payroll. You know, people are desperate, and we need to intervene somehow. And that New Deal. That man, that cripple, see if I got it, if I can find a dime to tell you a quick story, a true story. This is my crazy grandmother, neurotic. Margaret was neurotic, no doubt about it. This is Margaret. Franklin Roosevelt organized the March of Dimes, didn't he? I mean, that's on his watch, obviously, because of his polio. And so when he died in 1946, and, you, and if you're waiting to be on currency, you have to be dead, you know, so don't, if, you have to be dead to be on an American currency or to be on a stamp, all right? So I'm, I'm sorry, but certainly on currency. So Roosevelt dies, and in 46, his profile is put on the dime. Now, my crazy grandmother, Margaret, who raised, my, raised me and my brother for many years when my, when my mother passed away, that... Uh, and, and I only got this story years later. I remember her doing, always sifting through her change. You know, but when you're four and five and six years old, uh, you know, she's just going through a change purse. Well, the story is, and it's a true story, and I got this later on, you know, that she hated Franklin Roosevelt. She loathed Franklin Roosevelt, that man. He's going to ruin the country. And what she was doing is she was going through her pocketbook and, and looking for dimes and throwing them out. So, I don't know, in, in, in some chamber of her head, if I throw out enough dimes, you know, there will be no dimes in Illinois. 
and I can and I can eradicate the memory of Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I can't make that story up, you know. And I got that years later when I could process that, you know, and figure it out. And I never told her. She was so proud that I earned my PhD, and it's don't ask, don't tell. Speaking about, and she never asked, you know, what my PhD was thesis was about, and I never told her because she did not ask. And I dealt with Franklin Roosevelt, all right? That was my, he's my guy. And I know that if I, if I ever told her that, there would be a thump. She would have hit the floor. She's dead. And I'm out of my inheritance. And I knew that. The money was coming to myself and my brother. There were just two of us. And it was a nice piece of change, all right? The puns intended. So I never told her because I knew I would just hear, boom. And that would be it. Excuse me? I don't know about that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. But she would have, something would have happened there. Did it, did it take the form of a large cache of dimes? She threw them out. I, and I remember just pitching them in the trash barrel. And I, and I would, you know, I wonder why she's doing that. I, you, know, you know, you're four years old. Okay, I'm watching that Roy Rogers or something. And she's combing through her, her chain. <laughs> I'm off, I'm, off, I'm off track here. But I need to share that stuff with you. Because a 19-year-old wouldn't get it. You know, but you can see the humor and the, uh, and, and the whatever, whatever you want, the idiosyncrasy is a good word as well. So Roosevelt, we've got to put the American people back to work. That's our greatest primary task. And he said that in his inaugural, that first inaugural. Our greatest primary task is to put the American people back to work. And out of this will come the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Out of this will come the national, out of this will come the, the CCC. I mean, out of this will come the, the uh, let's see, the you know, high school students getting jobs and so forth. And, the, and, it, and what appears before the Supreme Court is the national, it's the Schechter brothers. And it's called the, the Sick Chicken case. Uh, they were... They dealt with, with poultry in New York and, uh, and, and kosher poultry, the, the Schechter brothers. And under the National Recovery Act, that, that there were certain requirements of shipping and packaging and sanitation and so forth because of, the, because of its, its chicken, you see. And the Schechter brothers were found in violation of the sanitary packaging of, the, of, of their poultry. And they were fined and threatened with jail, and they were fined again. And they took it to the Supreme Court. And, and the Supreme Court took a narrow definition of commerce, that this is the Schechter brothers only do business within a few geographic miles, if you will, of, of New York, and that the federal government cannot regulate commerce you know, for the benefit of jobs and, and, and health conditions if it, if it does not cross over state lines. This is a narrow definition. And the New Dealers, that commerce is national. Remember that issue was raised on the Obama health care? You know, what's commerce? And, and, and the courts agreed with the national health care definition of commerce. But the Supreme Court struck down the National Industrial Recovery Act. It's too broad. It's, it's too intrusive. It's defining commerce to the disadvantage of this of these brothers who have a local business in Brooklyn or Queens. I think they're the same place. But it's a, a, a same geographic area. The, this, the Supreme Court also struck down as unconstitutional you know, the Agricultural Adjustment Act for, this, and, you know, for, the, for, for the reason that the farmers were paid not to grow. In other words, to stabilize prices. And the, and the parity, the money came from what was called a processing tax, which the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional. What was the processing tax? When apples are converted into apple juice, you know, when flour goes into a loaf of bread, uh, when wheat goes into muffins, whatever, there's a, when, it, when it's processed, there's a tax at, at the processing level. And that tax is collected by the federal government, and it's used to subsidize farmers not to grow. The Supreme Court ruled that as an intrusive taxing power of the federal government. Absolutely intrusive. And they struck that down as well. 
Roosevelt is fuming at this. You're striking down the New Deal. I'm using federal government to put American people back to work. And, and, and Roosevelt, in the aftermath of his great re-election in 1936, and by, by, by great I mean this, Roosevelt and Eleanor and the New Deal carried every state in the Union in 1936. It was a smashing victory. Every state in the Union, except Maine and Vermont. Now, there are more cows in Maine and Vermont than voters. You know, it hardly mattered. It mattered to the good people of New Hampshire, because the good people of New Hampshire on the bridges and roads, you know, leading from New Hampshire, you know, to Maine and Vermont, they erected enormous signs. And the signs read, you are now leaving the United States of America. <laughs> now that's a shot at the voters of Maine and Vermont, and that is an endorsement of the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt. Even Roosevelt, yeah, it, it, even Roosevelt was, was shocked at the surprise of his victory. And he had 75% majorities in both the House and the Senate. I mean, he had coattails the width of, of, a, uh, uh, of a runway in Logan Airport. And now I'm going after the court. I'm going after the court. Everybody's pulling in the same direction except the courts. And this is his famous or infamous court packing plan of 1937. You know, the, uh, a, a few months after, he's sworn into a second term. And what Roosevelt proposes, and he's being completely disingenuous here, and everybody knows what's behind the proposal, that for every federal judge over the age of 70, you know, that I need to appoint another judge. Because at 70, you're old. You're worn out. You're exhausted. Uh, you've had it. You know, it's time to pack it in. Roll over, face the wall, and go away. All right? Roosevelt that these, the members of the Supreme Court, these are nine old men. That's his phrase, not mine. <laughs> nine old men. Another phrase, that the members of the Supreme Court have a horse and buggy definition of the Constitution. It is not 1837, it is 1937. And we need to juice up the courts. We need to rejuvenate the courts. So he picked the number 70, the, the age 70, because there were one, two, three, four, five justices on the Supreme Court who, six, six justices on the Supreme Court who were 70 or older. So what I can do to, to speed up the work of the court and make it more liberal and influence it, if I can get six more appointees on the court, I go from nine to 15, and that's a rubber stamp, assuming, assuming I pick the right men. It would always be men back then. See, one of, the, one of the issues is, it's all, I know, one of the issues, and it's always true, you know, it's when you put somebody on the court, you know, sometimes they, they're not acting the way you thought they would act. You know, it's like when you say, I do, you know, sometimes a year later, this is not what I raised my hand for. Wait a minute, this is not, I didn't bargain for this. Huh? Uh, the Supreme Court didn't always have nine men. No, no, absolutely, and Roosevelt made that case. I mean, it was as low as, f as five, it had been seven. Uh, it could be nine, it could be 15. There's no number, there's no number at all. So if I can put six justices on that court, I can swing it, you know, to the, I can swing it to the New Deal and make sure that there are no more New Deal programs declared unconstitutional. Well, after that, there were none. The, the uh, Supreme Court read the, read the tea leaves. Uh, they knew that they were on Roosevelt's radar and we better, we, we better join you know, in, you know in, the, in the effort to cure the unemployment of the Great Depression because it's not going away on its own. What, it, what, what, did, what did cure the unemployment of the, un, of the Great Depression was, of course, World War II, wasn't it? You know, the guys put on a uniform and went off to war, and the women put on a uniform and went to the factories and became Rosie the Riveter. So that's a good place to put a period and to segue into the court in the post-war period and the national mood in the post-war period. And the national mood was governed by the fear of the Reds, right? The fear of the Soviet Union, you know, the fear that we may be commun communized. And the Cold War and the Red Scare are very much a part of the 
the communal thinking, the community thinking of Americans after the Cold War. We need to protect ourselves, just as Wilson. We need to protect ourselves against those men and women who are opposing World War I. And we need to protect ourselves against people who might be pinkos, pink, or is that red? Red's even worse. <laughs> Pinko, fellow traveler, better dead than red. You know, that the sonic boom is the sound of freedom. Have the kids scramble under their desks so they can ride out a nuclear war. Everything will be fine in two days. You know, there'll be, you know, there might be, you might have to dust off some radioactive <laughs> ash. But other, and we'll have a few days off from work. We might have, in school, we might have to replace a few windows, you know, but everything will be fine. We can ride out a nuclear war. So, the, so it'll be the Red Scare. It'll be the, it'll be the court in the 40s. The, when, when a case, I'll, I'll just leave you with this too. I'll start here. When a case comes before the Supreme Court about the internment of Japanese Americans, and they get that case in 44, they say, it's okay. It's okay. And, I, and, and this, I'll tell you why. And this is the court. I'll tell you why it's okay. The government is doing you a favor. They're putting you behind barbed wire. Because if you roam the streets of Los Angeles, you would be beaten. You know, you, you know, because you're, a, you're the enemy. You're the concealed enemy. And so you ought to be grateful that the government stepped in and, erased, and arrested all of you guys. You know, put you into these camps because they saved your lives. So get out of here with this. We dismiss this. And that's a six to three ruling. And I'll do a little more of the detail on that. And that rolls into the, uh, the Cold War. And you want to date the Cold War? I'll give you my start time for the Cold War. March 1946 in Fulton, Missouri at Westminster College. Truman had invited Winston Churchill to Westminster College to accept an honorary degree. Churchill was out of office. And in his remarks, in his remarks, Churchill gives the world the, the metaphor of the Cold War, Iron Curtain, that an Iron Curtain has slammed down across all of Eastern Europe. And behind that Iron Curtain lie all the ancient capitals of Eastern Europe, that Stalin has turned Eastern Europe into a prison camp, you know, that his rule is grotesque. An iron curtain. It's a great image, isn't it? It's like the Berlin Wall, which is more than an image. It was there. The Iron Curtain, soon to be joined as communism leaks to the east with Mao Zedong, the Bamboo Curtain. The Iron Curtain and the Bamboo Curtain. Now, the Bamboo Curtain sounds like a Chinese restaurant, you know, but it, but it isn't. It isn't. It's, it's Europe and Asia, and that is part of the court. That is part of the psyche. That is part of the government dealing with this. And Harry Truman, Harry Truman, one more thought. By an executive order, trying to fend off charges that he might be a red, and these charges leveled by conservative Democrats and by conservative Republicans, Harry Truman, by an executive order, broadens grounds for dismissal from a federal position this is where language is important, from proof of disloyalty, proof, to reason, proof of disloyalty to reasonable doubt of loyalty. So what's reasonable doubt? Proof of disloyalty to reasonable doubt of loyalty. And that, and, and, and that, and, and so, so one could comb through the, the files of a federal employee. You know, in the 1940, 1947, 1948, a, if you deliver mail, you're a federal employee. If you work at the, at the airport for the FAA, you know, and you're, you're pulling a plane in with your flashlights, you're working, for the F, you're working for the federal government. Proof of disloyalty to reasonable doubt. And that is going to be such a punishing change of language. So I'll see you all soon. Uh, next week, right? Yes. Next week, right. So we'll do some real good unfinished business. We'll button up next week. So I'll see you all later.